could you envision something like a coordinated attack like that on multiple kind of points of, of interest to the infrastructure? This is what happened with Stuxnet, right? So they got into the PLC system. You know, somebody had a malicious USB, they plugged it into the system and they spun up the centrifuges in Iran and uh, blew up the centrifuges uh, that were used to enrich uranium. uranium. So you can imagine uh, somebody who works in one of these plants, a power grid plant, you know, getting paid a million dollars to upload some software. Welcome to The Neutral Ground. Can hackers actually be the key to our national security? You might be surprised by the answer. In order to stay ahead of the cybersecurity war, we need people to try and break in. That's right, we want people to try to test our infrastructures. This concept is known as ethical hacking. And it's just one of the many really fascinating topics that me and my guest are going to discuss in today's episode. Dr. Daniel Graham is an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. His research interests include secure embedded systems and networks. Before teaching at UVA, Dr. Graham was a program manager at Microsoft in Seattle, Washington. He publishes in IEEE journals relating to sensors and networks. We talk about the celebritization of hackers today, what a coordinated attack on our infrastructures might look like, and how both of us are actually a bit concerned about what a digital culture might look like in a thousand years. If you would like to support our efforts to bring civility back to mainstream discourse, hit the subscribe slash follow button, leave a kind comment or rating for me and my guest, and consider sharing the show with a friend. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Daniel Graham. Daniel, welcome to The Neutral Ground. So we're going to be discussing all things cybersecurity and hacking related today, but I actually want to begin by asking you to talk a little bit about how you arrived in this field. Was it something you were always interested in, or did you have key moments and people along your life path that brought you here? Um, yeah, so the way I got interested in uh, cybersecurity was uh, I used to uh, be an entrepreneur when I was a lot younger. And um, one of the things I'd like to do was uh, build websites. And uh, when I was building these websites, uh, I built a, a website called spyideal.com. And this is when game discs were still around. And it was a used marketplace for games. So you could search uh, for a particular game, you could get a game disc, and you could buy it. And uh, it was based on WordPress. So the WordPress framework was underneath. And then uh, some people discovered my WordPress site um, and hacked it and replaced it with an effervescence theme and a landing page. And I was curious about how this was done. Um, and so I started uh, digging really deeply into the source code and I found the web shell that they dropped. And I was like, wow, I, I should really understand how to do this. Um, and so then I spent a lot of time kind of just learning and I joined um, one of the forums that I really like reading. It's not dedicated to hacking, but a lot of the underlying kind of fundamentals of hacking are kind of discussed there. Um, and it's 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 public. It's actually a lot of programmers read it. It's called Hacker News. So it's news.ycombinator.com. And if you're a computer scientist or interested in computer science, this is a great place to kind of go and learn. Um, and so then I yeah, reading a lot of articles on on Hacker News, um, and uh, then I I was tasked with teaching a course on network security. Um, at the small college in Bridgewater. And uh, I started writing a lab manual. And as I started kind of writing, I realized that there was, there was kind of a desire for sharing this. And so I kept putting my thoughts down. And one of the great parts about like writing is it really helps you kind of think. So as I started writing, I started really thinking about 
um, some of the concepts that I understood kind of at a very shallow level and started exploring those more deeply. Uh, and I think that was my journey. It was just, you know, getting my um, kind of business compromised and then um, learning how and then just kept learning as, as I was going along. That's fantastic. What I, what I love about that is rather than just kind of just get upset, which I'm sure I'm sure it was upsetting at the time to get hacked. Um, but rather than just get upset, you wanted to find out, OK, well, I'm going to, to use this to try to learn what exactly did you do? Not even not even just to to make sure or to try to stop it from happening again, but because. I'm kind of just curious here, you know, and that's that kind of natural curiosity that I think we need in general in education today all around is this idea of I'm going to kind of take an initiative and look myself and try to figure out what you did so that I can learn from this moment. So that that to me is that's fantastic. And and the idea too of of writing and trying to write your way into understanding it as well. Um that's absolutely perfect. We talk about that all the time not even just in my class, but it comes up kind of naturally lately, believe it or not, on the podcast. People are like, I'm writing my way to try to figure this out. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I like it. So that's great. Well, speaking of the, the writing here, in the foreword of your book, Ethical Hacking, A Hands-On Introduction to Breaking In, you talk about how hacking can now infiltrate elections, power grids, and our transportation infrastructure even. And you follow this by saying, with this level of influence, it is imperative that we not only teach ethical hacking, but also encourage it. Let's pull up here for a moment and lay some foundation. What is ethical hacking? Yeah, the term is kind of nebulous and not really well defined. Um, but the kind of emerging definition is coming along with the lines of uh, pretending to be an adversary um, and trying to gain access, but instead of using that access for malicious intent, um, you're going to inform the organization or group um, about how it was done. Um, so there are bug bounties out there. That's a, a big group. And in the bug bounty community, uh, you can search for um, vulnerabilities on uh, Tesla. It's part of bug bounties. Uh, Google is a part of a bug bounty program. And if you find any bugs in their systems, you can report it for uh, cash price. Price isn't huge. It's like, you know, five thousand, ten thousand uh, dollars But it takes a lot of time to discover these bugs. Um, the... One of the things that's um, super interesting about these bug bounty programs is that some bugs are benign, but the more valuable bugs um, can be used for very malicious purposes. And the um, bug bounty hunters, and the hackers in this case, have a choice of whether or not they sell those to the company or they sell it on the black market. So if you find a vulnerability that allows for remote code execution in iOS, for example, those are very valuable because that means that a lot of these remote code execution things are zero click vulnerabilities. So I could send you a message, which you can choose, you can't choose whether or not to accept or not. So I text you um, and it contains an image. And as your phone parses the image, uh, it will read in code that's embedded in the image that will exploit your phone and gain root access. That's called a zero click vulnerability. So uh, companies like Zerodium will buy those for a million dollars and up. And so you could choose to go to Apple and you could say, Hey, Apple, I found this vulnerability, uh, which definitely took you a lot of time, a lot of work and a lot of thought. And they will compensate you in the tens or hundreds of thousands. And, or you could go to a company like Zerodium and then sell your exploit um, to them. And they might in turn turn around and sell it to a famous Israeli company called uh, the NSO Group. And they sell custom software for hacking devices to uh, hacking mobile phones to be specific to state actors around the world. 
And so they would pay um, a lot of money for an exploit like that. And so you have this kind of ethical choice, you know, do you go and report it to the original equipment manufacturers like Android or Apple, or do you go and you report it to uh, these um, third party sources or state governments? And this is common knowledge among people in the trade who understand that this is just all kind of openly how because you because you say it almost so nonchalantly. And so this is something that's openly known. Yeah. Um, yes. The bug there there are a lot of hackers that choose to go the bug bounty hunting route. Um, and there, there are other groups that choose not to. Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's, it's very kind of open. A lot of people also use bug bounties as a way of breaking in to the community. So they'll go and they'll go on sites like hacker rank or bug crowd, and then they'll, um, find, uh, vulnerabilities mostly in web systems. So, and then, then once they've found a vulnerability in a web system, they'll use bug crowd or hacker rank. Um, to report it. Uh, and so that's that's kind of one choice, but all of those people who are on those sites could choose not to report. Would you say that there's a, a community? It is, well, let me, let me ask it this way. Is there a strong community of people in that group who encourage each other to just you know, bring those bugs to the companies themselves? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I think it, there's, I think most people who are in cybersecurity are actually ethical and good. And so the majority of people either who, you know, work for some three-letter agency in the U.S. or uh, work for security companies through, in the U.S. are actually have really good intent. Um and so the majority of people, maybe just by mass, you know, encourage that behavior. And in terms of community, surprisingly, the biggest hacker community that I've found um, is actually an open one. It's on Twitter. Uh, so a lot of the communication, the sharing of information, uh, you know, the kind of thinking is actually in the public. Uh, public sphere. And um, there's a lot of responsible disclosure in the community. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that the, I'd, I'd say Twitter is surprisingly a, a, an amazing place to find a really good um, people in the security community to learn from and really, really great resources. Um, and so if, if you're new to the hacking space, um, Following people on Twitter is great. Um, Three Cube is a great person. He's an ex-college professor. Uh, started his own company. He's written several books. He's a no starch author as well, but he um, he writes under a pseudonym, um, and his pseudonym is Occupy the Web. He's great. Um, there's XX Rat, who's really amazing bug hunter and has some great courses on bug hunting. Um, the Vicky is another no starch author. She just came out with a um, another book called Bug Bounty Bootcamp, um, and so she's also very talented. So there's there there are several people. Uh, in in the space and these people are all on twitter <laughs> and they all kind of share their stuff like hacker hackerrise.com is by occupy the web um three cube on twitter and so yeah it's a great place to, to kind of learn and, and explore so nation hacking right where global powers are kind of hacking back and forth this seems like a fairly new kind of war. It's not brand new, but fairly new kind of war that will actually never end, really. How do ethical hacking principles help us defend ourselves from global threats to our infrastructures? Yeah. So one of the things that I like uh, giving people a feel for the scale of this is that I like using the example that some people would rather go a day without running water than a day without Wi-Fi. 
And it's just that our infrastructure is so dependent on networking and sensing that failures there can have catastrophic consequences. For example, we saw the Colonial Pipeline uh, example where uh, this uh, pipeline system, which is a SCADA system, it's just a, a industrial control system, um, got compromised and the CEO at the time made the decision to shut down the pipeline. And uh, that caused panic buying and gas shortages. And then we saw an example where a bug in the uh, flight notification system for pilots uh, caused airlines to be grounded. So we could have very intentional um, attacks like this, but together, not just in a single attack, but uh, with multiple um, of these simultaneously. So you could imagine gas shortage, planes being shut down, uh, stock market uh, crashes, not being able to use your credit card, you know, not being able to swipe or uh, pay for things uh, that would limit your ability to do groceries. Then you could imagine the logistic systems that move trucks around um, the country, you know, errors there with routing and shipping of goods. And so a lot of our productivity kind of depends on technology. So the, the reason that we've been able to do this kind of massive advances in um, how much we can produce is because we've gotten better at producing. And one of the things that helps us to produce more is being more efficient. And we've used technology to do that. And so if we cripple that efficiency, we'll notice this kind of massive reduction in our production. So if, I mean, the Luddite approach would be, hey, get rid of all this technology. But the problem with that is that we would also significantly reduce our production. And a lot of our production, our ability to produce, really depends on our ability to share information, get data, sense things about our environment, and then make really good decisions. And that's all at the core of that is our connectedness. So how connected we are to our systems and to our people. And that feedback loop really lets us be more efficient. The more I can learn about an environment or a group, then the more efficiently I can serve them. And in order to do that, I must be connected to them. And so as we, as we kind of consider this future of uh, being more connected, sharing more information, and in several ways, being more efficient, that just enhances how we could have our productivity crippled. And so we need more people like really paying attention to how well the walls are that we build around our cities and or infrastructure, because that will really help us, um, you know, secure our future. And the one of the things that um, that's kind of hard is that yes, capitalism works. It has its drawbacks, and it produces a lot. There are people it leaves behind, and there are things that need to be fixed. But it also breeds jealousy among groups that don't apply these principles. So, if somebody sees a society being more productive or gaining more influence, then it's natural for people to feel threatened by that and jealous by that, and then attack that society. And so, I think a lot of the advantages that we will see from technology are yet to come, especially with enhances in our productivity for AI, how quickly we can uh, produce artifacts, uh, digital artifacts and phys physical artifacts using AI. And you can imagine that other groups around the world will um, not like that and be jealous of that and uh, decide to um, kind of attack or demo democracy on, on those grounds. And then there are other things like um, this notion that uh, we need to get feedback from the people in order to make decisions about leadership and law and policy, because we want uh, a leadership that reflects the desire and will of the people. And that's kind of the heart of democracy. And in order to do that, we've been moving to, because as our population has increased, we need more efficient ways of counting, tabulating and sharing uh, votes. And well, that efficiency has come through technology, but that's also created um, some l vulnerabilities to uh, or a process. And 
and the hard part with this is that um, technology can in some ways seem magical. It's very difficult to understand all of the pieces. And this kind of notion of something that's magical and mystical or not clear can breed distrust. And so even though the systems might be secure and well-functioning, like in the case of our electoral systems, um, because there's so much mystery there, uh, you can breed distrust. And so there's it's a difficult problem with thinking about you know, technology for efficiency, but also trust from the people and how do you strike that balance? The thing that I find with your comment about elections really interesting is that you don't have to attack the election infrastructure itself, like the tabulating or the reporting in order to influence an, an election. Um, you could imagine kind of third party things like you could dissolve trust by misinformation. You could um, limit people's access to uh, polls by, you know, attacking traffic control systems that manage traffic in a particular area. So you can make it more difficult for people to get to the polls. Um, you can uh, do things like um, attack the power and electricity grids in particular locations. Uh, a lot of these machines, you know, tab these polling machines, these electronic marking devices run on um, power. And so if you don't have power, then you kind of delay the voting process. But I think what we've noticed with the American populace, the public, is that um, the public's really resilient. Like during COVID, during um, times of the, the pre-election um, concerns, I think people are able to kind of really see what's true and what's not and, um, and really survive a lot. So it, even if there was a significant, I think, attack on the election infrastructure or infrastructure around um, the election infrastructure, there would be a lot of resilience from the American public. They would, they would know what was going on and they could see past it. And the, the kind of diehard attitude uh, will just allow them to push through regardless. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's funny. You, as you were saying all of this, you, you mentioned diehard attitude. I'm going to show now just how much of a kind of a, a film nerd I am. I still remember when the, the fourth diehard film came out, uh, Live Free or Die Hard, I think it was, was with uh, Justin Long, as well as Bruce Willis. And the thing that was fascinating about that particular film is it it sort of talked about what you're discussing right now, it looked at this idea of a coordinated uh, kind of infrastructure attack using nothing more than basically a couple of laptops to get in and, and try to figure out. And what they were able to do was essentially shut down uh, Washington, D.C. Again, this is a movie, but I'm, I'm saying this because at the time, I remember having conversations with some people and they kind of looked at it as well, I mean, that's a bit much, right? You couldn't really do all of that. And even just with my my uh, kind of small background knowledge on this compared to you, I remember thinking, oh, no, no, I could see that. <laughs> I could see someone being able to actually do that. I'm not saying it would be easy, but I could see someone being able to do that. Could Could you envision something like a coordinated attack like that on multiple kind of points of, of interest to the infrastructure? Yeah, I think, I think in order, yes, I can. And I think in order to, to like, kind of just see this, the thing to consider is where things are made. So um, if you manufacture something, there's nothing that prevents you from inserting code or hardware into that device that you can control remotely at some time. So these, you know, or power grid, for example, has a lot of little processors in it, little chips. And a lot of those chips are built in the US. And at the heart of one of these chips is a programmable logic controller. What it is, is a programmable switch. It's like a switch with a computer. So you can say on, off, on, off. And then, you know, these power are like levers and actuators, things like open valves, things that open and close. Um, 
And so you, this is what happened with Suxnet, right? So they got into the PLC system. You know, somebody had a malicious USB, they plugged it into the system and they spun up the centrifuges in Iran and uh, blew up the centrifuges uh, that were used to enrich uranium. uranium. So you can imagine uh, somebody who works in one of these plants, a power grid plant, you know, getting paid a million dollars to upload some software. They upload it, it's benign, nobody knows, it's just sitting there. Um, or if you manufacture these systems, you know, you, you um, compromise the person who's building it, you put some software there, then every power plant around the world has these. So these supply chain attacks would be very useful. Um, and even if you just bubble up from one la layer, if you, if people can do it, if there's somebody, you know, who can press a button to say, turn off the power grid or disable a power, a nuclear power plant, then, um, you, that person is, is compromisable. And so you can, with sufficient cash or, um, or other means convince them to do something kind of malicious. The, the part that I think um we need to to kind of consider as a society when we think about um about these kind of attacks on our infrastructure is how how resilient are we you know how long can we go without um power and so on and i think the preppers you know have gone down that path where they're like yes we need to prepare for this apocalypse um, but I, I don't think it's going to be that bad. I think that we can recover pretty easily unless it's some destructive attack. The harder part for me is I'm worried about something that's beyond the infrastructure, which is that as a civilization, civilizations of the past have created physical art artifacts like pots, pans, um, paintings, but all of our artifacts for or civilization has been have been digital so we've had all these digital artifacts like um, digital art podcasts um, digital media and that that's kind of or or kind of stamp on the world for this time and the hard part with all of those artifacts is that they're ethereal so they'll like they'll disappear with time and it's possible to kind of wipe out an entire culture by deleting this content. And a lot of this content is stored in data centers, you know, throughout the U S and throughout the world. And so you can imagine wiperware that would wipe all our Facebook pictures, all the pictures that we have backed up to the iCloud, all of our podcasts, all of our music. And uh, that, really wipes our cultural identity. And that pain isn't a like physical one, it's more of an emotional one. So we could take away infrastructure and so on. But I think the physical, the emotional pain of losing the artifacts that we've created as a civilization could be detrimental, you know. Uh, you know, losing pictures of your, your children as they're growing up, losing, videos of them and we don't have those things printed out we don't, we don't have them hanging up on our walls at home and so in order to remove that kind of cultural identity is we don't need a kind of physical attack anymore we can do this kind of cyber attack targeted at cultural artifacts and so that's that's a very sad um thing that's fascinating you know, I, my, um, I've thought about this a little bit myself, right? Because, you know, I, I find anthropology and archaeology interesting. And so whenever they talk about finding something new, some sort of new marker, uh, a, a vase or, you know, a pot or whatever it is, I do find that actually interesting because I like the idea that we can learn more about that culture through those artifacts. And so uh, I think you're right about there is something that is a little, uh, maybe, maybe something we should be thinking about a little bit more in terms of what we're leaving behind as our legacy, as a, as a culture, 
my brief uh, connection to this came in like around 2008, 2009. Um, I'm, I tell all my family members the rule of three. If you have something that that's important to you, have it in at least three different places digitally, you know, whatever those are. I, however, though, didn't take my own advice well enough. And in the same hour, I not only had a corrupt memory card with pictures that I couldn't recover. Yeah, I could have probably, maybe I could have spent more time trying to get it recovered, you know, through software or something like that. But those were gone. And somehow I messed up and deleted my backup um, online. And I thought, oh my God, just like that, they're all gone. All the pictures I took are gone. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, for about a day or two, I was, was pretty upset. And then I kind of realized, well, wait a second. I had so many pictures. Was I going to actually go through all of them again, really? And in that moment, it completely changed the way that I look at digital pictures and, and how I value them. And this is not to say anything against people who who take wonderful, beautiful digital pictures and, and use them and whatnot. But we have collected now, we have so much data today, so much. How are we even supposed to sort through that to figure out what is worth looking at and, and what isn't? You know, like you could imagine thousands of years ago, somebody makes a pot and you can imagine talking to them and they'll look at you like it's just a pot. <laughs> Like that's it, right? But for us today, how many thousands of pictures do we have digitally that are just a pot, really, <laughs> you know? And so I think you're right to be kind of interested in this in this idea. Has that has that thought process changed the way that you look at digital artifacts? Yeah, so it has. So during the, for example, we saw wiperware for the first time publicly in used in a war in Ukraine. Um, and you could see that as a kind of psychological thing. It's like start to wipe out the culture and put in a new one. Um, but uh, in, in terms of the thousands of photos that I kind of create over time, I've realized that like artifacts, these things become more valuable as time passes. So like a photo that might seem trivial like if i look if i took it yesterday and i looked at it today but if i took it yesterday and i look at it 30 years from now uh, that's that's a whole different feel for the photo and so that's that's one of the things that has kind of changed my perspective on the artifacts that i kind of create the other thing i try to do is i try to take every moment that i can or everything that i produce and then distributed at scale. So one of the things that's really valuable of digital artifacts is not self-consumption, but uh, consumption by uh, people that are around you and people that you don't know. Um, and so for the things that I create, for the moments that I create, I try to kind of share them widely um, or what as wide as possible. And I think that really helps increase the uh, value of the of the artifact because it makes it more of a community artifact than a personal artifact. Um, and the, yeah, it, I think the kind of ethereal nature of some of these um, things too is a little concerning. Like, you know, a lot of the media that we produce is now going to fade. And so I own some books that are hundred years old. And I, I don't know if the Kindle books will be around in a hundred years. Um, and that's kind of made the artifact in some way less valuable because it doesn't last as long. So the working up the commitment to create a digital artifact um, seems harder than working up the commitment to create a physical artifact, just because you know it will fade and um, it won't get uh, consumed. I think the other part is it's like at the core of all of these artifacts is this kind of like the ideas that people have in their minds. And that's kind of one of the great things about 
hacking as well. It's not not just about compromising a physical machine. It's about creating in someone else an idea. This is a social engineering. That's what hackers call it aspect. So with the colonial pipeline, you compromise the pipeline. That didn't cause the shortage. The shortage was caused by the panic buying. And so if you wipe um, memories, the damage isn't to the memories that have been wiped. It's to the psyche of the person who had those memories. And so this attachment to digital artifacts is uh, something that I find really interesting. That, um, it's not something we hold in our hands or display in our houses. It's uh, just electricity, a series of ones and zeros, but we have an emotional attachment to these digital artifacts and they can help us feel a particular way or feel sad or feel happy. Um, and that's a strange thing because it's not, it's not a, tangible thing you can't smell it you can touch it you know but what it does is it really goes straight to your your heart um and that's that's a powerful thing i think that's why people like looking at pictures or listening to videos or reading things i think it's i think those are yeah more psychological yeah i think you're you're absolutely right and <clears throat> In a previous conversation, we, we talked a little bit about this uh, social engineering part. And so I want to kind of stay there for, for a couple of questions, because what you told me in the previous conversation, you used a very specific term, which I thought was, was really interesting. We tend to think of hacking and cybersecurity as kind of um, human versus machine. But what you kind of talked to me about last time is this idea of cognitive hacking, thinking about the person, the individual, uh, the people on the other side. So can you explore this just a little bit more for us? Why is it better for us to think of cybersecurity or hacking in terms of hacking people? Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the things that I found really powerful is a, an idea thinking, um, is just like thinking in outcomes. So really, when you perform some action in the world, be it digital or physical, you want to change not the environment, but the behavior of people. Um, because that's really uh, what we all want. You know, we want make, to make people happier. We want to make people feel more secure. Um, or if you're malicious, you want the opposite of those things. And so uh, when we write... For example, you know, we write essays or papers. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to influence the conversation. And the end goal of inference in conversation is influencing how people think. And the same thing when, um, you know, you perform some uh, cyber attack. I think the goal, end goal is not just to compromise the system. It's to get some information that gives you leverage over people or an organization or an organization or influence the behavior of the people in that organization. And so uh, really at the heart of it, there's this idea of hacking people. And then people are really their mind, their like cognition and how they think about the world. And so really you want to hack the brain. And so this is this notion of uh, cognitive hacking and really all the things in between are just tools. So you know, the machine is just a tool for providing visual stimulus to the to the eyes and to the brain. And um, then you have, it captures thoughts and ideas in terms of artifacts like Word documents, text documents, pictures, and so on. But these are all uh, sn snapshots of a thought or the physical phenomenon. And so you gain information about that person. I think one of the kind of really cool ideas I didn't coin this term, uh, but it's called a mind virus. So you take an idea, you can use some technology to transmit it to people. You know, you could do it through a video, you could do it through um, implanting content on their machine, but really the goal is to get them to have a particular idea, thought. And the part where it behaves like a virus is that, that once, they, once you've implanted that thought, they share it with other people. So it could be, this is a really very good strategy for misinformation. You know, <clears throat> you could say to people, Hey, uh, the sun's actually white. And they go, 
No, I look up at it, it's yellow. You go, oh, but it produces white light. Take a prism, hold the prism up, and you'll see all the colors of the rainbow. And that's why we have rainbows. It's just because white light's dispersed into all the colors. But really, the sun is white. And so people could say, hey, no, this is not a good idea. They reject it. The sun is yellow. And so you could have this mind virus that says, hey, you know, look up at the sun. It's yellow. All these people are telling you that white that light is, is actually white light. They're all lying to you. And that could spread. Um, and so these concepts of like mind viruses are really clever. It's like get people to absorb an idea, have that idea not only change their behavior and how they perceive the world, but have them spread that idea to other people. And then using the right um, tools, you know, be it technology tools, media, so on, you could convey that idea. And so I, I think when you think about hacking is that end result is the end result not being the machine, but the human, uh, it really kind of transforms um, how you see the consequences. So normally people say, oh yeah, I, I lose my phone and get a new one. But really that's not, that's not it. If somebody compromises your device, they know about who your friends are, your, um, where you've been, they know they begin to know not your device, but they begin to know who you are as a person, um, who you interact with, what you love, what you like. And that gives them the ability to influence you, your personhood, your thinking. Um, and so the reason for securing our devices isn't just to protect our information. It's really to protect our minds. And so I, th I think this when we see that awareness that this is a doorway to who we are as, as individuals, that it's important for us to say, hey, uh, I'm going to make a conscious decision about my security because of I want to protect my individuality, my thoughts, my freedom of expression. And I want to have the ability to choose what I read, listen to, and how I think. And this is the kind of disadvantage with ads, you know, ads influence our behavior and people pay a lot of money because they work. So if I show you an ad repeatedly, I mean, it's going to cause you to buy that product. That's why people pay money for ads. Um, and so th the same ideas with ads could be applied to other technology, technological ideas. In, in the social engineering section of your book, you have this uh, fantastic example of deep fake technology and specifically uh, Bob Marley uh, talking as <laughs> President Barack Obama. And that, that made me laugh as well, thinking of that in, in, the, in the moment. But it also brought up a different idea into my head as well, which is, of course, this it's been emerging for quite a while, but the emergence of really well done deep fake technology, I could imagine a moment in the future, maybe present even right now, where you might see a video of someone you love, someone you care about, maybe even yourself saying things that you didn't say, you know, again, kind of hacking the person like we've been talking about, us, ourselves. And, and I, I like that idea that you brought forward that securing our digital kind of personal digital devices is also a way of trying to help our own psyches, to protect our psyches. Is, is deep fake technology something that we really should be more worried about than we are? Or do you think that we'll always be able to stay somewhat of one step ahead of it? Um, I think that's a great question. I, I, I'm in two minds about this. The first mind is that human beings are amazing at detecting what's, what's real and what's not. Um, it really, we've, we've done such a good job of looking at animated, uh, people in games and on television and going, that person isn't a real person that's fading though. Um, as the technology's been getting better, it's a lot easier to look, a lot more difficult to look at something and say, hey, that's not a real person. Um, and that really 
has consequences for us, not simply because it tricks our mind, but because of the way humans learn. So humans are social learners. So the example I like to kind of talk about when I talk about this idea of social learning is that the Europeans used to think tomatoes were poisonous. Um, and how do we know that tomatoes aren't poisonous? Um, I mean, our parents fed us tomatoes. And so we learn a lot of how we see and view the world through social interaction. And if we can distort that, that social learning and we replace it with something that's fake, especially around people we trust, it, it really kind of corrupts how we learn as human beings. And I, that, that can be very detrimental. So I think, I think deep fakes that don't uh, implant ideas might not be so bad. You know, things that are funny or in jest or um, for movies. I think the other thing that um, people are kind of concerned about with deep fakes is like blackmail and bribery. And um, I would say that we've had deep fakes in the still sense. So we've had Photoshop where you could Photoshop, uh, create a fake picture of somebody doing something. And as human beings, we've um, responded to this by being more skeptical of the media we see. So we just say, you know, that's not true. That must be a fake picture. Um, and we kind of default to our own values or, or experiences with that person. And so we've gotten really good at, I mean, Photoshop is amazing. I, I would say that you could create photorealistic fakes. Um, and so the ability to create photorealistic or video realistic video that's fake, I, I think we'll respond in the same way as a society. We'll, we'll look at it, we'll be like, that doesn't, um, that's not aligning with my values or what I believe about that person to be true. And we will reject it. Um, there'll still be, you know, a, group that believes it but i think for the majority of the population they'll respond to deep fakes i mean realistic deep fakes in the same way they respond to realistic uh, photoshopped images um and so i i'm not worried too much about um influence in that sense in terms of slander or defamation but i'm i'm worried about it in terms of learning so you know somebody says that you know, deep fake of an influential person saying that the way you cure a particular disease is by doing X. Um, and people are like, oh, I trust this person. I'm going to learn from this person. The idea aligns with my values. This seems like something that's real. I'm going to act on it. Um, but places where judgments passed or people are trying to be def defamed, I'm not, not so worried about those. You mentioned a, a blackmail and that makes me that kind of leads us into another question that I had here. So data breaches in, in terms of companies have been going on for a, a long time, you know, a very long time actually, but there's been increased interest recently specifically in, in ransomware. And in fact, according to IBM, the share of data breaches caused by ransomware grew 41% in the last year. And the cost of these breaches increased in that time over 430,000. Thousand uh, dollars. So, what is ransomware specifically, and why is it seemingly so successful? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll tackle that in two parts. So, ransomware, what it does is it goes, it encrypts all the files on your computer and then demands that you pay to get your files decrypted. So, it holds your files for ransom. Um, I talk about how to write ransomware in my book, um, and uh, it's not it's not that difficult to write ransomware. Um, what's what's I think kind of driven ransomware to be more prolific is that we have ways of collecting a ransom over the internet that is anonymous. So, if you wanted to move money around before, banks could trace it. And so it's like very difficult to collect a ransom. You know, you're going to get it in gift cards. Um, so now that we have digital currencies that are harder to trace, the, the, the ransoms can be demanded in a digital currency and then you could collect it. 
So the economics of ransomware, I think, is what's driving it. Um, it can be very profitable. Um, and groups that write it and deploy it, deploying the ransomware, though, can be a little bit more tricky. So social engineering deployments is one, but finding like vulnerable systems and compromising them, uh, that's, a, that's another approach. Um, but still, you know, the deployment takes, um, takes some effort, some creativity as well. And hiding is also a little difficult. But the part that's rewarding is that you can have these digital currencies where I can demand a ransom, you can pay me, you can never find me. Um, and uh, this is a sad part about kind of the original vision for these digital currencies, which was more decentralized control. You know, if you're in a, in a country in the world where it's not stable and you hit a war and your currency goes to nothing, ideally, if you had one of these decentralized currencies, it's fine. You know, you could still um, go somewhere else. All your assets would transfer with you. You could escape the conflict and um, you could still exist. You could have your family. The... I mean, you could move money around. People could transfer money to you from you. But the anonymous nature of it has caused, um, has proven problematic. And there are so many advantages to the anonymous nature. It means that if you were persecuted by your government, they couldn't seize your assets. Um, you know, you're in a country with a corrupt government. You hold these digital assets. They can't go and they can't say, hey, you know, you're purporting ideas that we don't like you lose your assets. But then it also, on the other side, makes the economics of illegal activity um, a lot more appealing. So I think those are the two things that are kind of driving uh, ransomware. Interesting. I think the, people might say, oh, you know, well, <laughs> all these companies are being hit by ransomware. Like, don't they just have backups? It's like the rate at which you're creating data, you know, in, in a, in a couple seconds, you have several people accessing or buying from your store or doing transactions online. Backing up all of this stuff is not easy. It's not a trivial uh, task. And then managing that recovery process as you're getting all this new data in, the rate of ingestion uh, versus how quickly you can back up and restore, it's not, a, not an easy problem. So. Yes, backups are a way around this, uh, not around, but a way to kind of be prepared if you are attacked. But managing those backups for a, for a large company is not an easy thing. Yeah, that's a fantastic point that I hadn't thought of before is, is how do you manage that, that constantly moving data stream of information? Um, wow, yeah, that's actually really difficult. That's a really difficult problem to, to deal with. We... We used to have this image of the hacker, you know, as someone alone in a basement and, you know, in the dark and, you know, Neo kind of things from the Matrix and stuff like that. Um, but recently, over the past couple of years, I've noticed that more and more hackers have been kind of coming out and speaking on in, in a public forum, whether it's a podcast. Lex Friedman had uh, famously a hacker on talking about um, his exploits and things like that. And so I'm I'm curious as someone who kind of lives in this world, does the recent kind of celebritization of hackers, do you think that that helps or, or hurts our efforts to stay ahead of potential threats in the future? Oh, I, I think the best hackers in the world are the ones that are not saying anything. Like, uh, like the tailored access operations group of the NSA. Like those guys are probably the best in the world, and uh, they're especially their research group. Um, they'll 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 probably never say anything. Um, and then the like the Russians, like the GRU group, they'll they'll probably never say anything. <laughs> and uh, the um, the guys who are like spending like all the time just kind of focused on on you know zero days for like Macs and iOS um they'll probably never say anything i think there's a there's a really good public group like i would say almost on the nation state level um 
who who are who are public, uh, and that's Project Zero at Google. Those guys are top talent, um, probably the best in the world in the commercial space, and uh, they write blogs um, every day about the vulnerabilities that they find, um, and they're very kind of technical, um, technically deep. I don't know if they've come out with kind of a, a persona, personality, and and discuss things in public. Um, I've, I just haven't been aware of any of their their interviews, but I'm I'm sure they've given some. Um, so I I do think that the celebritization of of um, of the hacker might be a little disappointing for some of the silent professionals that are really in the weeds on a day to day basis. Um, and they might, I don't know how they would feel about it. If I was in their position, I, I mean, I, I would be of two minds. One is I wouldn't care. It's like these guys don't really know all of the, you know, the the, the deep secrets. Um, and then maybe another mind is like, hey, I wish I could come out and like help people learn about this stuff. Um, and so, yeah, this this is such a such a difficult thing. The other part, I guess, is that I think the celebritization of of hacking. I mean, it started well before Snowden, but I think Snowden took a bunch of secrets from the NSA and made them public. Um, and he was like, he was a system admin. He he wasn't one of the tailored access operation guys. He's not people who are working on you know trying to uh, develop new exploits or any of that um but you know he took all these documents and released them to the public and people were like oh my gosh this is like the capabilities that are uh there we need to kind of protect ourselves uh from this um and i think that created a whole new uh, spin but uh i i think it's in our nature to want secrets you know we want to know you know what secret things are going on we want to know you know, what secret capabilities are out there, you know, um, people are like, oh, what secret things do the does the government have that we don't know about? I mean, Snowden has proved that the government's pretty good at keeping secrets until they lose a person, right? So they had all these secrets for a very long time. People had no clue. And then um, he kind of released it. I'm sure that since then, you know, new capabilities have been developed that we, that won't, won't be shared with the public. Um, and uh, I think that's that's a great thing. I mean, uh, it's fun to search for secrets. It's fun to like think about these things. Um, but uh, some things are a secret for a reason. And so uh, I think that's that's good. I, I I I do think that the these things exist in cycles. So people will be really curious about hacking for a little while. Their curiosity will be satiated, and then it will go back to being kind of like a, an underground thing. Uh, I also think that people are fascinated by this because it's their hacking concepts are really technically deep, like a lot of system stuff, operating systems, networking, programming in languages that some people consider difficult, like C. Um, but then you have these kind of human relatable parts. So, if you're very interested in the technical side, you could go really technically deep. And then there's these human parts. It's like, you know, this affects me. Um, this can change, you know, or take away things that I love or desire or help me protect things that I love or desire. And so there's this great kind of spectrum. Um, and then people can find themselves in any part of it. And so the entry into uh, these ideas around hacking, I think are, very appealing um i think the really really good people uh, are like you'll never hear from them <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's understandable yeah. well you, you've been in incredibly generous with your time i really just have one kind of final question for you here so as someone who's in this area in this field what is one thing that makes you nervous about the future of this field and one thing that makes you hopeful about the future of this field? Oh, that's a good question. I think the thing that makes me most nervous is 
there's been this explosion of creativity in computer science and ideas that stem from computer science. And with that creativity has come this, like build things really, really quickly. It doesn't matter if they break, share them with the world, the world will react and then we will deal with, you know, whatever the consequences are. And that's worked really well because people reject things that they don't like, people accept things that they do. And we've built so much great stuff. There's this kind of difficulty with building something that's secure and robust and building something quickly. And if we start putting more weight on building things that are more secure and more robust, it will slow the rate of, it could slow the rate of innovation. It's like putting up a bridge and making sure all the parts are great to spec is excellence. I mean, but it takes longer to build that bridge than building a bridge that gets you over there. And then people try it and they're like, oh, great, I like it. And then you kind of pass the bridge as you're going along. Um, and we've had the first approach. The thing that makes me kind of a, a little sad about this is that we will slow the rate of innovation. And I, I also think the cognitive part is really sad, like that we will not only slow the rate of innovation, but will hurt um, people along the way. Um, and so that's, that's really uh, sad. I think the thing that is hopeful to me is that this is a, I believe, fun intellectual challenge. Um, so the great part about all these cybersecurity concepts is that it really spans the gamut of computer science. So normally there are two kind of major categories of computer scientists. There's a theoretical computer scientist and the systems uh, scientist. So a system scientist would focus on things like the operating system, the network, the hardware. Theoretical computer scientists would think about what things are computable? Could we build a quantum computer? If we build a quantum computer, what it would look like? Um, you know, can we prove particular properties about a program? The cool part with cybersecurity is that these two come together. So there are things like, can we prove the security of a program? Can we build a quantum computer that cracks encryption? How do we build more uh, uh, quantum resistant uh, cryptography? And so if, if you're in the field of cybersecurity, you could go over here, you could do system stuff. And then if you're over here in the theory uh, part, there's a lot of theory stuff to do. And if you are super interested in both, you can move back and forth uh, to your heart's content. Um, and so this is, a, this is a great, I think, field for kind of intellectual pursuit and, and innovation. And people who are interested in machine learning, like ChatGPT3, you know, that's gotten a lot of stuff there. President Obama once said that one of his biggest fears was actually an automated hacking system. And so I think there's a lot of promise in that. I think there's a lot of promise in building systems that can um, automatically find uh, vulnerabilities and then do proof of concept exploits. Uh, I think that would be a great thing for the innovation speed because internal companies could run these and um, you know, it could innovate at whatever rate they wanted to and then have um, these systems kind of help them along by finding things. Just to kind of add that note, I mean, Google has, you know, Chrome and Chrome is amazing. And there are tools like the, their fuzzer they have in house. And you think Google has the best, some of the best developers in the world. Um, but Chrome still has bugs that are exploitable. <laughs> you know, Chrome has bugs that are exploitable that if you visit a particular site, you can uh, get code from the website onto the, the machine. So you can compromise the machine just by somebody visiting a website. <laughs> and people find these all the time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, that's what makes me like super hopeful. It's, 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 it's such a hard problem to solve and there's so many cool um opportunities for innovation and talent and just thinking about problems in both this kind of systems and theoretical space. And you don't have to just become a specific 
type of person to work in the area. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great way to kind of bring this to a close. I, I agree. I like the idea that <clears throat> you're you're interested in in seeing what AI can do to actually help us in terms of that speed of innovation. And yet at the same time, I'm I'm a big believer in the in the human being still. Yeah. So I like the idea too that we're still involving us uh <laughs> meat bags as people like to say sometimes which i think is hysterical um but yeah you know daniel thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this information with us yeah really? i had a great time chatting with you um i hope the little mic bumps aren't too disturbing to the audience and you had great questions and i i really liked I really enjoyed kind of chatting and um just kind of shooting the breeze and if yeah. people want to find me danielgram.com is my website. Perfect. I'll make sure to put a link to in the episode notes as well. Thank oh, you so much. Should we be more concerned about coordinated efforts to attack our infrastructures in America? From our conversation today, the answer seems to be a resounding yes. What can we do about it? It seems like there are two answers here. First, we need to train people in ethical hacking. The better the people we have testing our infrastructures, the more likely they are to find potential exploits and then shut those down before someone else can get in. But I also really like Dr. Graham's answer here as well. Human resiliency. We need to fortify our minds and understand that this is now a part of our world. By helping each other, we send the signal to those who might wish to attack us that we are stronger than our machines. Now. We just have to believe it. Remember, support our efforts to bring civility back to mainstream discourse. Hit the subscribe slash follow button, leave a kind comment or rating for me and my guest, and consider sharing the show with a friend. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on neutral ground. And have a great day.